Excellent. Uh, well, welcome and good evening, everyone, to our final public art boot camp webinar. Uh, tonight, we'll be talking about the life after project completion, uh, post installation rights and responsibilities. Uh, first, we're going to do a little bit of housekeeping. Um, if you need closed captions, WebEx has an automated closed caption feature. Uh, in multiple languages, uh, you can see where you might find it on your screen in this image right here. Uh, we do plan to have a Q&A after the session. Uh, please, uh, during the presentation, if a question comes up, please use the Q&A or chat function to submit your question. Uh, the chat will be monitored by uh, uh, staff and we will uh, read questions at the very end. Uh, if your question is for a specific speaker, please put their name at the beginning of the question. Uh, and please note that this program is being recorded and will be made available on the Office of Arts and Culture YouTube website, uh, which you can see here. Uh, we have a whole playlist for all of our boot camp uh, webinars, and I hope you check them out. So getting started, First things first, we always like to center our commitment to racial equity uh, and remind everyone that the Seattle Office of Arts and Culture commits to an anti-racist work practice that centers the creativity and leadership of people of color, those who are most impacted by structural racism, to move towards systems that benefit us all. We additionally need to acknowledge that we occupy the traditional territories of the Coast Salish peoples, whose ancestors have resided here since time immemorial, this acknowledgement does not take the place of authentic relationships with indigenous communities who are very much still here, but is just the first step in resisting their erasure. So now that we've done that framing, I wanna go ahead and just frame our conversation for tonight. Um, once uh, artwork has been commissioned and completed, certain rights may be retained by the artist unless otherwise waived or transferred. Um, with those rights come responsibilities to provide certain documentation or contact information to that commissioning body, uh, and doing so helps that commissioning body ensure your rights. Uh, tonight, we'll be discussing two main uh, different uh, rights, first being copyright, and then second, those conferred by the Visual Artist Rights Act of 1990. Um, please also note that this discussion is not going to be comprehensive of these nuanced and sometimes dense topics. Instead, we're aiming to provide foundational knowledge so that you know what to look for and what questions to ask when these considerations arise. So tonight we're going to be joined by two panelists. Uh, we have Michelle Pham, an attorney from Helsel Fetterman, uh, who specializes in intellectual property law. And then uh, Adam Eisenberg, adjunct professor at the University of Washington, who teaches legal issues in museums as well as criminal justice uh, classes. So without further ado, we're gonna jump right in uh, to Michelle's presentation. Michelle, if you wouldn't mind taking it away. Sounds good. Hi everyone, I'm Michelle Tham. Um, I am an attorney at a firm in Seattle called Helsel Fetterman. We've been around for actually over 130 years. Um, I do a, a number of things there, but for the most part, I do intellectual property work, um, working with artists, entertainers, um, publishers, uh, among a number of other businesses. And I advise on um, protecting your intellectual property, how to monetize that, but also being ready to litigate if, if uh, my clients need. So have a little bit of background in this area. I used to work in-house at the Seattle Art Museum. Um, I actually met Adam at a museum lawyer event uh, seminar. And so let's get into copyright basics. Well, I guess before that, I got to do a legal disclaimer. Um, everything I say here is uh, it for informational purposes only. It doesn't create an attorney-client relationship. Um, so if you ever have questions for legal advice, um, please consult an attorney and actually engage them um, in that way. Let's move to the next slide. So I wanted to jump back and give you a broad overview of intellectual property and where copyright fits into that. 
Next slide, please. So I, I'm sure many of many of you know that intellectual property is all around us. It's you know just creative works, right? Fixed into something tangible. Um, and you can really think of um, intellectual property kind of like real property, like buying a house, for example. You can sell it, um, you can rent it, you can rent out portions of it, which in intellectual property we call licensing. Um, and you can also lose your rights to certain intellectual property. You know, you got to protect your borders. Um, and so there are times where you can lose a chunk of it or lose protection over it. And obviously you can monetize that and you can, um, and a lot of companies or you in particular as an individual um, can gain value from it, right? So intellectual property, like I said, it's a product of our human intellect, it's creative inventions. Um, and why do we protect it? Um, we want to support people who are um, creating for the public good by ensuring that um, artists or you can benefit from your efforts, at least for a certain amount of time. It depends on the type of intellectual property. And um, the most common ones that we hear about are copyright, which are original works of authorship, um, fixed into something tangible. We have trademarks, which are, you know, logos, um, uh, slogans, et cetera, anything that might denote to you as a consumer um, who's creating creating it, right? There's patents that protect inventions. Um, there's two types, utility and design. Um, and there's a separate type of intellectual property law that protects those. And then there's also uh, trade secrets, things that um, are not made public. Let's, for example, like the well, like the Coca-Cola recipe, right? That you um, don't want the world to know about. And so you do, uh, you take every effort to keep it secret. All right, so here's an example, just looking at a Nike shoe, how all four of these um, types of intellectual property really interplay. So you see with the Nike swoosh mark, that's a trademark. Whenever you see it on something, you know that it's likely from Nike, you know what type of quality is going to come from it, um, and it denotes Nike. Copyright is kind of like the design, um, the coloring here, um, the threading design, um, that's protected by copyright. Trade secret might be the assembly technology of the fabric itself. And then the design patent is, you know, like this knitted upper area. Um, it protects that design um, of the, the, the knit itself. All right, moving forward. Let's get into copyright law, what it is, um, some protections you can get from it. I'm gonna go over some common myths and do some myth busting with you. And then we'll talk about some licenses and assignments along the way. So first, what is copyright? I kind of said it, couple times already, but um, copyright is a legal right of authors, and we call creators, artists, people who create um, artworks, for example, authors in uh, copyright law. So the creator, author, it means the same thing for us. So copyright is the legal right of authors to control the use of their original creative works for a limited period of time. So um, as soon as you fix your idea into something tangible, you know, sculpting a piece of ceramic into um, a vase or a mug or um, putting that oil on canvas, uh, that's fixing it into something tangible. It's not, it doesn't exist in your mind anymore. Other people can see it, they can touch it, for example. Um, so that means that ideas can't get, be protected, right? Um, uh, copyright only protects eight categories of things, and that's what I've listed here. Dramatic works, literary works, sound recordings, musical works, architecture, um, choreographic and works and pantomimes, pictorial, graphic, and sculptural works, 
as well as motion pictures and audio visual works. Um, remember when I said you can analogize um, copyright law to like real estate, owning real estate. So um, there's different rights that you get when you create a work and there's six of them that's listed here. You have the right to reproduce the work, potentially perform the work, display it, distribute it for sale. You can lease it, transfer ownership of it. You can create derivative works from it. So um, an example of that would be turning um, a novel into a screenplay or you know, making a movie out of it, for example. Um, and and auth the last one is authorizing other individuals to carry out any of the above activities. So um, you can keep ownership of all of these rights, or you can sell all of them, or you can sell portions of them. Um, you can also give people rights temporarily or long term to, to do one or more of these things. Um, and an exception to ownership. So when you own um, a work, the rights to a work, um, and you create it yourself, you're not doing it you know, as part of your employment, for example, you have unfettered 100% ownership of your work. But, you know, if you created the work as part of your job, um, it falls under what we call work made for hire. And that's something that your employer would own um, automatically. Uh, and then if, for example, you were an independent contractor and you were hired by somebody to create a work, then um, you may be considered an independent contractor or in your contract, you might have language that says, this is going to be a work made for hire. Um, if we can move forward to the next slide. So, You've probably all heard of the term work made for hire, um, and it's specifically defined in our law, as I said, whether you're doing it in, within the scope of your job or you are specially commissioned to do certain things. And it only you can only have um, the work made for hire only applies to these bullet point items here. You know, a contribution to collective work, translation, compilation, um, atlas, etc. Um, for anything beyond that, though, um, uh, it's not a work made for hire. So um, later, we're going to have a Q and A session, and I know I'm kind of rolling through this really quickly, um, and. I'd be happy to answer more details on a work made for hire, but generally um, it's what I said is part of your job or it was um, specially commissioned in one of these categories. Just know that when work made for hire, especially in the contractor context, has to be in writing and it has to be specifically called out as a work made for hire or a special commission. Okay, moving forward. Um, there's some additional things that you could do to protect your copyright um, ownership. You can take an addition, well, like I said earlier, you have automatic copyright protection as soon as you create your work, but you can take an extra step and register it with the US Copyright Office. And um, that creates a public record of your ownership. And it's also required um, to register with the Copyright Office before you can file a lawsuit against anyone for infringement. So um, it's, it's really beneficial to do that. Um, and you want to register it prior to any infringement, not to avoid any further delay. And then you also, if you can prove the infringement, um, get damages out of it. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later. You can also do something very simple, which is to add the C with a circle around it as a copyright notice to others as to when you created it and who owns it. So that if anybody wanted to come to you and say, hey, I really wanna you know, 
um, use your work or maybe take a picture of your work or do something with your work um, and and I want to pay you for it, they know where to go. Um, so that helps too, moving forward. All right, so I mentioned I would go into copyright infringement a little bit more. So um, the, those rights that I mentioned earlier, if you find out that somebody else is violating your copyright rights, you know, maybe they're disseminating photos of your work for financial gain, for example, um, you can potentially take it to court, right? Um, and if you do go to court and you do win on an infringement claim, you have the choice of getting actual damages from um, the person who infringed on your rights by by getting their profit, the profits that they got um, from using your work, or you can choose statutory damages. It's up to you, um, and it's complicated the types of damages that you know the which amount of damages you can get. But in general, you can your damages can range from two hundred dollars per instance of infringement all the way up to $150,000. Um, and you may have the right to get attorney's fees and costs back. Um, and there's even uh, criminal consequences for people who willfully infringe and get financial gain. Um, sometimes people say there's this rule of thumb that, you know, if somebody's infringing about 20% of your work, um, that it's infringement. There's no real rule like that. Um, it's kind of like a wives' tale. It's a, it's typically a lot more complicated than that. Okay, I'm going to roll through some common myths really quickly. Um, let's move up forward. So some people say it's an old work of art. It must be out of copyright, right? It must be in the public domain, and that's a myth. Next slide, please. Copyright has an expiration date, and I didn't want to put this like complicated flow chart or um, on onto the screen for you, but um, hopefully you have access to these slides later. And I included a link to a place where you can really do a double check and it lists out a chart with um, when a work is published, as in like made made public. Um, uh, when it was registered, it, uh, the expiration date really depends on a number of factors. Um, but, you know, for works after 1978, for example, um, it's generally the life of the author or the creator plus 70 years. So your copyright rights in your works um, can extend past your lifetime. Uh, and so it's something that can be passed down in your estate. Moving forward. Um, another myth is, I found it on the internet. It's That's public, right? That's in the public domain, right? Um, and that's not true. Next slide, please. So publishing, as in making it public, is not the same as a work going into the public domain. It, um, it really depends on that expiration date that I was telling you about. Um, and so, a good rule of thumb is by default, just assume somebody owns it and that you need to get permission. Um, and you know, you can work with attorneys to find whoever's holding on to those rights and to get those licenses. Um, and tip is to use works that are actually in the public domain, or for example, um, items like um, images that are um allowed to be used under like creative commons licenses i'm not sure if anyone everyone's heard of that but moving on to the next slide um you might see little uh boxes like this on on works online and that's kind of an indicator of creative commons licenses and each um symbol uh denotes the level of rights that you can use, like let's say a photo online for, right? So for example, the first first one um, where it says attribution CC and BY means that um, this 
own copyright owner would like attribution and allows you to um, distribute a remix, adapt, or build upon the work, for example. Move for moving forward. Um, fair use. So that word that that word gets thrown around quite a bit. So isn't it just fair use? If I change it just a little bit, is it fair use? And um, if that's a myth, moving forward. Fair use under our copyright laws is a defense. Um, it's not an exception to copyright. So that means that um, if you are gonna try to claim fair use, it's, uh, you know, it typically requires the, the, the copyright owner to make a claim, potentially bring a lawsuit, and you don't immediately get out of it by claiming fair use. You have to basically prove your fair use um, as part of your, your case. So um, it's not an easy get out of jail free card in a way. Um, and it's not uh, easy or clear either. Um, the fair use test is, um, it can be pretty complicated. Moving forward. Um, so I wanted to address freedom of panorama too. Um, so freedom of panorama is a legal right in some countries to publish pictures of artworks, sculptures, paintings, buildings, or monuments that are in public spaces, even while they are still protected under copyright. So um, it's so for this day and age, we have people have cell phones, they're taking selfies, they're taking pictures of things out in the world. Your public works, your public artworks are out there for the world to see, right? And when people are walking down the street and they see some cool piece of artwork and they want to take a picture of it, post it on Instagram, for example, um, what are your rights in those instances? And oftentimes it's addressed by, you know, everything I said before with copyright law, but also freedom of panorama. And it depends on the country that you're in. So I'm just going to talk about the U.S. today. Um, uh, can we move to the next slide, please? But as you can see here in this map, um, each country deals with it differently, but in the U.S., you see that it's yellow, and that means that um, pe that people who take photos um, in public of protected copyright works, uh, you're allowed to take photos of buildings only, not of art other artworks that are um, out there in the world in the public. So. In the US, typically buildings are protected under copyright. And, um, but there is an exception in our law that allows people to take pictures of buildings. Um, uh, but it, and so people are free to do that. But if, you know, you have a sculpture out there and somebody's taking photos and making making postcards out of it, selling it for their own financial gain, for example, you have a right to stop them um, from taking pictures of your artworks. Obviously, that's different for every country. Uh, moving forward, please. Okay, so this is actually my last slide. Um, I think I'm coming up on my 20 minutes. Um, so I wanted to leave you with a few uh, ways to protect your copyright rights. You want to make sure that your work is properly marked, you know, the copyright with the little, the C in the circle, um, registering it with the copyright office, um, keep records of um, your creation and when you created it, you know, a video, photos that are dated and timed. Um, if you want to uh, allow others to have certain rights to your works, maybe for a limited time, you can enter into licenses, you can enter into agreements with other people who create with you to delineate your, own, your ownership or co-ownership. And then something that I didn't um, address very much is assignments. So licenses are limited rights 
to your copyright rights. Assignments are actually transfers of ownership. So you're actually like selling or giving someone else your rights. Um, and, and so that's the difference between licenses and assignments. Um, if you find out that somebody is infringing on your copyright, you want to send out cease and desist letters. Um, you work with an attorney for that um, to protect your copyright rights and then um, potentially go to court. That is copyright in a very, very, very quick nutshell, but happy to answer questions later. That's my contact information as well. Thank you, Michelle. That was wonderful. And now I'm going to hand it off to Adam Eisenberg to talk a little bit more about Vara. Adam, take us away. Thank you. That, that was great, Michelle. Um, we've known each other since 2014 when we were at a conference together. Uh, so I'm going to talk briefly about the Visual Artists Rights Act, or otherwise known as VARA. And I'm doing so as a, I teach museum law at the University of Washington for our museum studies program. So next slide, please. So VARA, fall, VARA rights fall into two different categories. There's the right of attribution. So artists have specifically the right to be recognized as the author of the work to prevent attribution of their work uh, to works they did not create, to prevent um, their work from being attributed to other artists. And in other countries, but not in the United States, they are allowed to publish anonymously or uh, using a, a pseudonym. We do not allow that in the United States. Uh, also, artists are allowed the right of integrity, the right to prevent the modification, mutilation, or distortion of any work um, in some cases, it can even mean that you have the right to prevent them from being destroyed. However, it's really important to understand this only applies to the original work itself. It doesn't apply to any sort of images taken of the work or things like that. Uh, next slide. So also VARA has very specific categories that it applies to, and we're gonna see how this plays out a little bit later uh, in some of the cases, but it only applies to paintings, drawings, prints, and sculptures. Uh, that exists in a single copy or limited edition of 200 or fewer, signed and consecutively numbered. It also applies to photographic images that are produced for exhibition that are in a limited number of 200 or less, signed and... Um, so that means that number 201 is not protected by VARA. Number 202 is not protected by VARA. So uh, someone could damage that and you wouldn't necessarily have um, protection. Next slide, please. So VARA is actually a subset or it supplements the copyright law. So initial, so as a threshold, the object uh, or the art has to actually be copyrightable in order to qualify for protection. So if it doesn't fall under um, uh, a suitably creative item, it doesn't get VARA protection. Um, and VARA is actually based on a French concept of moral rights that uh, artists enjoy independently of their property rights. And so an artist retains their VARA rights even if they no longer own the artwork. Next slide, please. Also, unlike copyright, which you can, uh, because copyright exists for the life of the creator plus 70 years, that means that it can be transferred via wills, uh, and you can also give your rights away. However, VARA rights cannot be, um, only the artist can make a claim under VARA and the right dies with the artist. Uh, and so it cannot be transferred via will, it cannot follow an estate. Uh, a VARA, a, an artist can give up their VARA claim and they may do that in a contract and in, in a written agreement. But uh, if they do not give up their right, they retain it um, as long as they live. Next slide. So VARA was created in the late 19, uh, late uh, 1980s and early 90s. So it came into effect and officially applies to works created on or after June 1st, 1991. I'm smiling because this was a law created by Congress, which means even simple things are not simple. So they carved out an exception for artists, for uh, creations that were created before June 1st, 1991. They still may have VARA protections if the work was not transferred by the artist before that date. So in other words, if the artist still owned the artwork, 
the sculpture, the painting, the, the drawing uh, before June 1st or after June 1st of 1991, they have VARA rights to it. And then this is the part that makes no sense because remember VARA rights die with the artist. Well, for this unique exception, um, apparently the protection lasts for the life of the artist plus 70 years. Now, how that actually works if you're not allowed to transfer the rights and it dies with the artist, I don't know. But I suspect this, I, I'm not aware of any cases explaining how this would work. And I think as we get farther away from June 1st, 1991, it really doesn't become an issue. Next slide. So um, the other thing to know about VARA is unlike copyright, which the federal government controls. So the Federal Copyright Act is for the entire country. And what you should know is that every other country has their own copyrights and their schedules are completely different. So, but in the United States, the federal government completely occupies the copyright world. However, for moral rights, some states have acted, enacted specific uh, statutes that protect the artists in those states. California, for example, has the Art Preservation Act. I think that's the earliest from 1979, and you'll see that that predates VARA. So New York adopted their own in 1983. Other states followed suit, and that is one of the reasons the federal government decided to create VARA on a national level. But what this means is that you, you may have separate rights in the state that you live that protect your artwork in addition to what the VARA rights are. So you need to find out uh, by exploring what rights exist in your state. Next slide. So the way we understand how copyright works and uh, VARA works uh, often is how the courts interpret cases and show how the, the law works, or they, they tell us how we should interpret the law. So I have a couple of examples tonight, different stories to share with you, so you can see how the courts have figured out what VARA actually means. So the first case is um, the case of Wildflower Works. This is a park that was in downtown Chicago. Here's several pictures of Wildflower Works, uh, and it existed for um, 20 years, and it was the creation of, the, of artist Chapman Kelly. So I'm going to give you sort of the timeline and the facts. So this is Mr. Kelly and some of his artwork. So back in 1984, he received permission to install Wildflower Works in Chicago's Grant Park. He promoted it as a living art, and it got quite a bit of attention. Uh, for a while, he and volunteers helped tend the art, uh, the garden as needed. But in 1988, the Park District decided to discontinue it and gave him 90-day notice. Now, again, this is before VARA, but he immediately sued, alleging a termination of the permit what violated his First Amendment rights. Um, I don't know how strong that legal argument was, but the Parks Department quickly settled with him and issued a temporary permit. Uh, and a nonprofit was created by his volunteers that allowed Wildflower Works to continue to exist, uh, or at least volunteers would work to help maintain it. But um, the permit did not create any proprietary interest for the nonprofit, nor Mr. Kelly, and, but it allowed it to continue operating after 1989. They extended the permit every year until 1994, and then after that, it just kind of had sort of a verbal agreement or actually the parks department just kind of didn't do anything. Next slide, please. So wildflower works just continued until March of 2004 when Kelly uh, met the president uh, of wildflower and the president of wildflower works, the nonprofit met a park district commissioner. And they were like, we haven't had a permit since uh, what early nineties. Do we need one? And the commissioner said, well, you're still here, aren't you? So that's all you need to know. Well, just two months later, the parks district met with Kelly and to discuss the fact that Wildflower Works wasn't being maintained very well. It had deteriorated. The goals uh, had changed uh, of the park and they really wanted to reconfigure it, change it from ellipses to, school, to diamonds or rectangles and do other modifications. They made it clear they'd go forward without Kelly's approval. Um, but they were giving him some, uh, you know, a heads up. He objected, but he didn't ask to remove any part of it before they started the reconfiguration. And a week later, they started to proceed with their plan. So he sued the park district, uh, claiming that they had violated his right to integrity 
or of integrity under the Va Visual Artist Rights Act. He also sued for breach of contract, claiming that when she said in March of 2004, you're still there, right? That that was somehow a contract. The trial court looked at uh, Wildflower Works and decided it was both a sculpture and a painting, but they said it lacked sufficient creativity to be eligible for copyright. And since that's the threshold for VARA, it therefore was not protected. They also said that they didn't think a site specific art piece was eligible for VARA. Um, but they agreed there was a contract issue and awarded $1. So then the case went up on appeal. Next slide, please. And Kelly argued Wildflower Works was eligible for copyright and VARA, saying that it was like other works that you see in public parks. So here's a couple of examples. Um, Jeff Koons, the puppy. So this gigantic sculpture, which is a metal frame sculpture filled with flowers, would appear in many different cities in the world. Uh, but it looked like this. It was a very uh, tailored, uh, very concisely created art piece. Um, Kelly argued that Wildflower Works was like this. Next slide, please. He also argued that it was like uh, this art, uh, artist Plenza's various different public sculptures. Next slide, please. Including this one from Crown Fountain, which had uh, images of people on two different screens. One more slide. Or next one, please. And uh, so Kelly argued that by analogy, his Wildflower Works was just like these examples, and these would be protected by VARA, therefore his should be protected. Next slide, please. So the appeals court said, first of all, let's go back to what VARA stands for. It only copyrights, it has to be copyrightable work in these specific categories, paintings, drawings, prints, and sculptures. The court said a landscape designer's plan put into writing could be embodied in a fixed and tangible meeting, but a quote unquote living garden is not. A living garden is not a sculpture. It does not fall under VARA. Next slide. The court also, by the way, said the oral contract where the parks person said, um, you're still here, right? So you're okay, is not a binding contract. And this is an important reminder for any artist, any writer, um, any designer, all your contracts must be in writing. Any important agreement has to be in writing in order for you to be able to get it enforced in the court. Uh, it, it applies to any sort of copyright agreement, any VAR agreement, trademark or licensing. Next slide. So the second uh, major VARA case that's come out had to do with the Five Points graffiti in New York. Next slide, please. So this case involved 21 plaintiffs. There were 49 destroyed works, and the jury found that 28 of those 49 works had achieved recognized stature. Eight more had been mutilated, distorted, and modified in a way that had damaged the artist's honor and reputation. So this case went up on appeal, but let me give you the facts. Next slide. So here's the basic timeline. In the early 1990s, the Fun Factory was a dilapidated building in a pretty rough neighborhood. Artists randomly started covering parts of the building with graffiti. By 2002, the owner of the building, Mr. Wolkoff, recognized that some of this, the value of this art and the merit of it, and he put a man named Cohen in charge of the graffiti. So. Cohen and several other artists rented studio space in the warehouse and they worked to improve the conditions of the warehouse. And they also like ran a major, if you will, public art show where there were specific rules. Mr. Wolkoff had said no pornography, no religious contact, nothing content, nothing political. And they had a non written agreement that existed for over a decade uh, where Cohen conti continually modified the and, and controlled how people would display their graffiti. Um, and then a decade later, Wolkoff decided he wanted to convert the site into condos. Next slide. So what you need to know is during that decade, Cohen's uh, under Cohen's control, the buildings had become a very uh, world famous uh, collection of uh, quality outdoor aerosol art. And there were rules, no one could pa paint over it without permission. There were short term walls versus long term walls. And Cohen had a final say as to how long a piece of art would remain. It was a very competitive environment. 
Uh, and when he heard that Wolkoff wanted to sell the building or wanted to trans, uh, turn it into condos, he actually tried to purchase it, um, but he was unable to uh, purchase and get the money out, get the money together in order to do it. So um, they sought an injunction, a temporary injunction to prevent Wolkoff from tearing it down until the artist had a chance to address this. Uh, the temporary injunction was denied pending a trial over the whole building. And during that time period, Wolkoff decided to just whitewash the building. So here's the next slide. So he just started whitewashing the building. While there was still a litigation question going on about whether the artwork should be protected and what should happen. Next slide. So the artist filed at that point a VARA claim. And um, VARA, the court said, unremovable work incorporated into a building is protected unless the artist waives rights in writing signed by both the artist and the building owner. And under VARA, artists are entitled to 90 days written notice to salvage their removable works. So there is this issue of in order to be protected, the works have to be of a recognized stature or intentional uh, or intentional mutilation and distortion uh, prejudice the artist's honor or reputation. And the trial court initially found that 45 of the 49 works had actually received achieved a uh, recognized stature. Next slide, please. Um, I should say that was the appeals court. So the appeals court said um, they did, you know, they did find that these art, these pieces did qualify for VARA. There were not any actual damages that could be awarded to the plaintiffs because they were unable to establish what was a relatable market for their works. Um, but there were statutory damages which were awarded, and those were extensive. The court also made the determination that Wolf made the determination that Wolkoff's destruction or painting over the building was a willful violation of the artist's rights. And that had he given them 90 days notice as required under VARA, they could have sal potentially salvaged, salvaged their work. So what's important to note is had he not destroyed five points until after he'd gotten his permits and he'd given the artists more than 90 days notice, he could have, um, he could have, you know, moved forward with his plan and suffered maybe, maybe just minor uh, statutory damages. But instead, he willfully painted over the building before the lawsuit had actually even been resolved. And so, next slide, please. Here's a view of uh, what replaced the building. Uh, next slide. So, on appeal, uh, the jury, by the way, imposed a $6.75 million verdict uh, against him. Uh, and on appeal, the court upheld it. He filed an appeal with the U.S. Supreme Court, and the U.S. Supreme Court denied the, the case. So he was uh, sanctioned six hundred six point seven five million uh, in in statutory fines. So the last example I talked about, I'd like to talk about, is the case of um, MoMA, the Massachusetts MoMA versus unfinished. I'm not sure how to pronounce the last name. Buchel, maybe. So next slide, please. This is the Museum of Contemporary Art. And this is the artist. And this is one of his pieces that he's created. It's a couple different pieces of his work. Take one next slide, please. This is another piece of his work called Home Affairs. This is another piece of his work, another example of his work, I should say. So he was commissioned to do a piece at Massachusetts MoMA. Next slide, please. In 2005. He visited the facility. He was going to do this project called Training Ground for Democracy. He spent seven days in residence uh, working with a partner to create a basic schematic of his proposed exhibit. In September of 2006, the museum sent a letter designed to formalize the project, but the letter was never signed. In fall of 2006, the installation of the project began, but the museum felt the artist's directions were too vague and he was not happy with their work. He was also traveling back and forth from Europe. Uh, in December of 2006, he left for the holidays and about he estimated that about 40% of the project was completed. By mid-January 2007, the tensions had escalated. The museum staff continued to work on the project, but they weren't really sure and the artist uh, had not returned. 
Finally, in May of 2007, the museum decided to cancel training ground. Next slide. But they decided to create a new exhibit called Made at Mass Mocha, featuring the unfinished project. So then the museum decided they would sue to try to get a declaratory judgment under VARA that they were allowed to present an unfinished work. The artist countersued. The district court initially agreed with the museum, finding that nothing in VARA presented, prevented rather, a museum from showing an incomplete work. However, next slide, please. Um, on appeal, the appellate court noted VARA is part of the Copyright Act. VARA must be read to protect unfinished but fixed works of art that, if completed, would qualify for protection and that the artist maintains the right of integrity to unfinished work. Next slide. So, looking at the, the, the pre-trial, this, this was a rule to decide whether the case would go forward to a trial or not, and the court said yes. Looking at the light most favorable to the artist, a jury could find the museum forged ahead without his permission and had damaged or distorted his vision. A jury could also conclude that the alterations had a detrimental impact on his, his honor or reputation. And they could also find that he had, the museum had violated his right of display under the Copyright Act. So while the museum had won in the earlier lower court, it lost in the appeal court and uh, it ultimately dismantled the unfinished work. So these are examples where the courts look and try to decide exactly you know, how VARA applies Next slide, please. Um, and this is an, uh, from the Boston.com news talking about how, you know, the public never saw the artist giant installation. Now the museum takes it apart. So it was big news in the, in the art world. Uh, and it's the first time that a court has said that unfinished works are protected by VARA. So we've seen several different examples, unfinished work, uh, graffiti on the side of the building could be protected at least up to 90 days with 90 days notice. and and living sculpture parks are not protected by or living 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 gardens i should say are not protected as sculptures next slide please so it's really important and, and um, michelle talked about this earlier about it's really important for you to um, seek out legal advice if you have issues about copyright or trademark um, and by the way i want to point out that uh, if you're uh, you do not need to put a copyright seal on an original painting and that's been true down through the ages so um, you know your painting is protected by copyright without having a seal on it um, or, or I should say you don't I mean it's good to put a copyright seal notice on websites and things like that but please don't start putting them on paintings because that's not required uh, to give people proper notice um, so, but I want to say that there are local, almost, almost every state has a local volunteer um, nonprofit where attorneys will work with artists. So the next slide, please. Um, this is the Washington Lawyers for the Arts, and you can reach out to them and artists, uh, you know, different lawyers in the community will help you deal with the issues that you have if you're unable to afford to hire an attorney, for example. Next slide, please. This is the New York uh, Volunteer Lawyers for the Arts. Um, and the next slide is the Colorado Attorney for the Arts. So every, every state, I think, um, or almost every state will have this kind of organization. So I would encourage you to look, and it's really important also to, to touch base to find out if there's specific laws in the state that you live in that uh, give you additional protections that you wouldn't be aware of otherwise. So thank you very much. Thank you, Adam. That was wonderful. And we are almost at time, but we have uh, a little bit of extra time for some questions. So I'm going to stop screen sharing. And we will hop right in. Um, I think one of the, uh, the questions that we tend to get a lot is um, what qualifies as getting in writing? And do emails count as written agreements? And then also, does that differ between, per, like, say, copyright or or VARA, or is it the same consideration for both? Um, and I don't know who wants to take that question. You want me to take it on? Sure. Why don't you start, and then if there's anything additional? Sounds good. 
All right. So um, when we say get it in writing, you know, we're really talking about contract law here, which is like a kind of a different beast um, aside from copyright. So um, I think one of the questions was, does, do emails count? And yes, they can. Um, but really the, the underlying basis for con whether a contract is formed or an agreement is formed is if um, there's agreement by both sides and it's acknowledged by both sides. Um, and, and in the context, for example, of work made for hire where it has to be in writing, you want to see both sides saying yes we agree, right? Something along those lines. Um, and for work made for hire, it actually has to be even clearer than that, where you say, this is a work made for hire, and the other person says yes, right? Um, that's in the case of an email exchange. Um, but in any other writing, you want to see both that indicators of that agreement on from both sides. That's probably a very simple way of answering the question. Can I just add that you have to think about how do you prove it in court? Because that's really what you need this for. And so think about all the emails with your friends that are not as clear as you wish they were. And so they're evidence and they'll come into court as evidence potentially of the intention of the parties. But you really want to have a formal written contract that lays it out very clearly as Michelle has just said. So that when you, if you have to go and defend your copyright, it's as clear as possible. So a Twitter feed, you know, probably not that clear, you know, TikTok agreement, not, not going to, it's evidence potentially, but it's not really. So a formal contract drafted by a lawyer is the best thing to do to make sure your rights are protected. Awesome. Thank you. And I think this one might be a quick one. Um, so I'll slide it in there. Um, do copyright laws differ from state to state? It's kind of like what um, Adam and I had said, copyright law is a federal law, so it extends across all of the United States, so it doesn't differ state to state. But you should know that trademark, you can, you can um, register your trademark locally in the state as well as nationally. Uh, so that's something unique to trademark. Um, and uh, as I said, VARA, in terms of VARA rights, some states have additional rights for you. So the copyright, as Michelle said, is that's one of the things that Congress did that made it clearer for everyone. It's just made a national copyright. Excellent. Thank you. Um, we had another one. Um, so for folks who use uh, reference photos for their work, um, that they uh, that they can find online or in reference guides. Um, is using those reference photos something that people need to worry about copyright wise? Or is that kind of a case by case basis? That's where I'm going to default to my usual, the lawyerly answer, which is it depends. <laughs> um, a plant itself is not an original creation. Um, and so, um, if you're, if you do your own interpretation of what the plant looks like, I think you're okay. Um, if let's say, okay, oops, sorry. Put this on the web. My Siri. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so if you, if let's say somebody took a whole bunch of plants and they arranged it in some unique way, maybe. Um, that is a little bit of a different story. And if you copy that actual arrangement, let's say, I'm just creating a hypothetical here, um, uh, then maybe you might have an issue in terms of copyright. Um, but if it's just one plant, for example, and there's nothing special about it, it's probably something very de minimis. If you're if you're painting roses or you know drawing from uh, uh, unless as Michelle says you're actually imitating a specific layout or uh, the the leaf is exactly a certain way um, it it shouldn't be a problem but you should you know definitely I, I I mean just generally it shouldn't be a problem but it's hard to know unless we were to see the specifics and 
Yeah. And there's like considerations for the copyright owner, you know, like, is it even worth spending the money for an attorney to come after you for it? Like how you painted a plant, you know? If you go on Facebook and a bunch of people put pictures of the plants they saw in Hawaii or whatever, right? You know, that, that stuff's all there. And, you know, if you just are being inspired by stuff like that, that's not something that would get you into terrible trouble. All right, I think we have time for um, a couple more. Um, this one might also be a quick one. Is there a cost associated with registering works of art? I'm assuming this means registering with copyright. That's right. Yes, there is. It's pretty minimal. Um, I think it starts at $35 for a single work, but you can also um, register collections as well. Um, but there's varying degrees, but. And uh, where would you go to actually register that copyright? Yeah, great question. It's the U.S. Copyright Office and it's uh, copyright.gov. Awesome, thank you. And then the last question I think we're gonna get to today, um, is an artist entitled to uh, to being notified before their commissioned mural is altered or painted over? I believe this would be a more of a question. Yes, VARA does require, assuming it falls in the categories that we're talking about, um, VARA would require that you get notice unless you've waived in writing that requirement. Um, but assuming, and the presumption is, unless it's in writing, that the artist has retained a bar. So, yes, if um, you know your mural is in a building that's going to be torn down, they are required to provide you with notice, so you have an opportunity to remove your art, or perhaps, I mean, I think in the case of uh, the graffiti at Five Points, I think mostly it would be somehow documenting it as best as possible with you know digital art or possibly cutting out part of the wall and taking it i suppose but um so you have the right to do that it's not unlimited um you know they you can't hold a building up for years but but you do have the right to go in and and so you do have the right to be notified and if they fail to notify you that's a vara violation Awesome, thank you. Um, and then one, I think it's a really quick question here. Is there a statute of limitations on VARA specifically? That's the, um, I, I would assume that the question kind of is about um, how long does VARA last? It lasts as, um, as long as the artist is alive. Jeremy, I think there was one question about freedom of panorama too. Um, would you like me to answer that? Sure. Um, the question was, um, do, do, do um, photography or plain air painting of buildings or structures with graffiti or murals on them, um, is that covered under kind of freedom of panorama? So, um, there's, assuming that there's different creators for both, for the building versus the mural, um, there, there's different sets of rights there. So the, for the building itself without the mural, um, you can freely take pictures or do paintings of the building, but uh, for the mural itself, that's, um, you, you can't just take pictures of that and do what you want with it. So the mural part is separate and you would need to get permission. So I just want to add that, you know, if you're walking down the street and you see this really cool mural and you want to take a picture of it, you can do that. You just can't make t-shirts out of it. You can't sell it. You can't make mugs. So um, you're not allowed to profit from it, but um, you are allowed to, you are allowed to like, you know, take pictures of stuff when you travel around and for your own private collection, because that's not, that's not hurting the artist. Awesome. Thank you guys both. Um, I think that was great. And um, that's all the time we've got for now. So um, we can stop our recording here and um, we'll thank you all for attending our final workshop in this series. Um, and we will uh, see you again next time. So, Jeremy, do we still proceed with?